Uh, yesterday, a lot of you missed it, but we had our um, Bridges Out of Poverty seminar on how to relate to and work with people who are from lower socioeconomic statuses, how to really have an impact in their lives. That went really well. I'm excited on where we're going in that area. I'm also excited because um, probably first part of August, we're going to launch our Hispanic venue. And if you don't know how that's going to work, we're actually going to have a large room here on campus, which will have a translation of, I'll work with them on Thursday to translate the sermon into Spanish, and they'll be doing a Spanish service on campus. All the kids will be together, and I'm excited. Matter of fact, we're getting, there's a, there's a buzz already starting. We've got quite a few Hispanic people already starting to show up in excitement, so we're, we're really excited about that. So lots of cool stuff going on. Before we get there, though, we've got to finish up this series called In the Beginning. And In the Beginning is a series, of course, in, primarily in Genesis chapter 1. And we've spent three weeks in it. And today, before I get into it, I want to tell you a couple of other stories. Because Moses and Genesis is not the first time and not the only time someone tried to explain the universe. So cultures have always tried to come up with stories that explain the universe. And one of them is from Babylon. It'd be about the same time as the people in Genesis were hearing their story. And it's called the Enuma Elish. And let me, t- let me tell you this story, and we're going to just... You understand why as we go through it. Um, now, in, in the Enuma Elish, there is only water, chaotic water. And then, for some reason, the water splits into sweet water and bitter water. And the sweet water turns into a male god, and the bitter water turns into a female god. I didn't write it. It's just what it says, okay? I had nothing to do with it. And the, the, the salty, bitter water is the goddess Tiamat. And those two, of course, get married, and they start having lots and lots of little, little god babies, and they have lots and lots and lots of them. And anybody here have lots of kids? Yeah, lots of kids means lots of noise and means not lots of sleep, right? And so the, 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 the father of those, of those gods, he starts getting ticked off because he can't get any sleep, he can't get any work done, and he's, he's really ticked off, and he's thinking about just eliminating all of them. You've thought of that, right? That, that has crossed your mind. I'm not saying you acted on it, or, but it, there, there's a part of your brain that went, yeah, that's a reasonable, or if not, if you hadn't thought of it before, you're welcome because you've thought of it now. And um, he tells his wife, Tiamat, that he thinks he's just going to off him. And she tells the oldest son, and the oldest son offs dad. Well, at this point, Tiamat, the mom, is ticked. So she declares war on all her kids. She's just coming down. She, and they're fighting back. They're trying to overthrow her, and it's just not working. And finally, a god called Marduk, one of, one of her kids, he rises up, and he manages to shoot an arrow that slices her clean in half. And he takes the two halves, and with one half, he makes the earth, and with the other half, he makes the heaven. Pretty normal story, don't you think? Okay. <laughs> And then Marduk makes humans out of the bodies of all the little gods who got killed in the war who were trying to overthrow the dad. So that's a a nice, friendly little creation story that, that the important thing is that's something that the Israelites would have heard. They would have heard a story like that, or they would have heard a story like in Egypt, where for Egypt, most, they have lots and lots of stories. Remember, they just left Egypt. So they've got the, all the stories, and there was just this, cha- again, chaotic water. There's water, and it's chaotic, and it's empty and barren, and a pyramid rises up out of it, and the creation starts that way. So all these stories, and from this, of course, there's a war, because as you read these stories, what you'll find is they're weird, but there's almost always a war. There's almost always a battle. There's a battle raging about something, and many, many gods are fighting this battle, and the one who wins gets this to be king god. Okay, so there's one that rises up, and of course, each nation would retell it to get their favorite god as the one who, who won in the end all the battles. And there's always multiple gods. There's always a battle. There's always chaos. There's always confusion. There's always... And that's the background that the Israelites heard. That's what, they, that's what they are expecting in a story. When Moses gets up to tell them how God created the heavens and the earth, when Moses does this, that's the story they're used to hearing. And now, with that in your brain, let's listen one more time to Genesis chapter 1, which says, In the beginning, 
God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And now you're going, ah, oh. formless, empty, chaotic, water, darkness. Sounds, but the next line, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. Where's the battle? Where's the war? Where's the chaos? Where's the fighting? Where's all the gods? Then God said, let there be a space between the waters to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters of earth. And that's what happened. God, notice every time it says that, and that's what happened. I love that line. God made this space to separate the waters of the earth from the waters of the heavens. God called the space sky, and the evening passed, and the morning came, marking the second day. Then God said, let the waters beneath the sky flow together into one place, so dry ground may appear. And that's what happened. God called the dry ground land, and the waters seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed-bearing plant, and trees that grow seed-bearing fruit. These seeds will then will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that's what happened. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with seed-bearing fruit. Ah, their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the third day. Then God said, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Then let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. Let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And that's what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day and the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, to govern the day and night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and evening passed and morning came, marking the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water, and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them and says, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the, let the earth, let the fish fill the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And evening passed and morning came, marking the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind. Livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock and small animals, each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image, to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look. I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he'd made, and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work, and God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. That's a really different story. That's just crazy different. There's, there's all the stuff that you're used to hearing if you're, if you're reading in that area just doesn't happen. Matter of fact, I was telling in the staff meeting, I was, I was talking about the other stories, the other creation stories and one, I think it was Jose, said something, that said, man, they sound like Game of Thrones. You know, it's like all these, all these little gods trying to overcome and battle each other. And then you come to Genesis 1, there's not thrones, there's just one throne. And there's no little G gods, there's just big G God. And, and there's no battle. Matter of fact, there's only one character in the whole chapter, God. And that speaks, and it, that speaks to them and it speaks to us something a little different. Because what it says, first thing we learn, we're just going to learn three things out of, this, out of Genesis 1 by comparing it to what they, they heard a long time ago. And that first thing is that God's in control and without rival. 
That, that first phrase, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God spoke. In the beginning, God works. I find it interesting that it takes me more energy and effort to turn on a light switch than it took God to create light. And I've been promising, if you've been here the whole series, I've been promising to tell you something really cool about this one verse in Genesis 1. If you haven't, you're going to hear it in the beginning. You're going to hear it really good. It says, God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day, the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. Some really cool stuff's going on in this verse that you may never have thought about. And I'll start out by telling you about, um, what was it called? The Jupiter Effect. Now, the Jupiter Effect was a book written in 1974. And what, what they predicted and saw was that in 1982 on a, on a certain day March 10th I believe in 1982 all the planets were going to be in the same part of the sky they were all going to be in the same spot and they said when that happens when all those planets are lined up that way the impact on earth is going to be catastrophic there's going to be earthquakes and floods it is going to be apocalyptic what's going to happen on that day March 10th 1982 they said in the 1970s because of the way the stars are lined up and they wrote that book, and does anybody remember March 10th, 1982? Who else old enough to remember March 10th, 1982? Remember that? Everybody remember being through that? Do you remember that? I don't remember a thing. <laughs> I was alive, I was in college, I don't remember a single thing, because absolutely nothing happened, because all those stars being lined up had absolutely no, all those planets being lined up, had no impact whatsoever on Earth. Now, in, sort of in the middle of all that, between the book, there was an, a British astronomer named Patrick Moore. And in 76, he got on BBC radio, and he was telling them, okay, there's a big thing coming today. Today, it's coming. Because Jupiter and Pluto are going to be exactly in line with Earth. They're going to line up exactly in line with Earth. And he said, what's going to be cool about that is if you time it exactly, if you go to the exact second where they're lined up, our gravity is going to almost disappear for just, just a second. We'll have like no gravity on Earth. So all you got to do is, if you get the timing right, is jump at that exact moment. And if you jump at that moment, you'll float briefly. And he's on the radio. He says, I'll, tell, I'll count it down for you. I'll count it. So he gets down to the point and he says, now. And all over Britain, people jumped and came right back down. Because they had failed to notice the date that he was making the prediction on was April the 1st. But he was making a really important point. You know all those planets and all those stars? Do you know how much influence they have on Earth? None! Zip! Are you an, a you're an Aries? Who cares? You're a Pisces? Don't matter! You can line them all up. It ain't going to make no difference here. And, and we'd have known that if we'd have paid attention. But throughout history, people have had this thing about the stars. They want the stars to predict the future. They want the planets to line up. And, and it, was, it was the same back then throughout history. In Deuteronomy, um, which is Moses also writing, it says, when you look up to the sky, see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God a port." apportioned to all the nations under heaven. Don't be worshiping stars. Don't be thinking the planets run your lives. And, and Moses made the point really cool in that. Go back to the Genesis verse. Put that back up there. God made two. Oh, what's missing here? God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day, the smaller one to govern the night. What's missing? What's their names? Why didn't he say that? Why would you not just say God made the sun and the moon? Well, if you're wanting to emphasize that they don't really have any power, you don't use their name. So Moses says, oh yeah, there's a big light and a little light. And God made a big light and he made a little light and he turned one on in the daytime and one's turned on in the nighttime and duh. And then, to make it even more powerful, he then throws in his little line. And he also made the stars. And he made the stars. Now, you know, from our perspective, we go, do you know how many stars there are and how big they are and how big that creation right there, he also made the stars, how humongous that is? For us, we see the power. For them, though, it's like, what do you mean he made the stars? Stars are huge. Stars are powerful. Stars and planets, they have an influence on our life. No, they don't. It's like God made the universe. He makes the sky. 
he's got a sun and a moon. And so he goes, you know what would be cool? Sprinkles. <laughs> and he makes sprinkles and puts them all over the universe. And that's how he views the stars. That's how he wants you to understand the stars. They're sprinkles God put in there to make the universe look cool. Now, there's more to it than that, but that's the emphasis right here, is they have no power, they have no influence, they have no impact. Because, why? God is in control without rival. No little small gods, no planets, no stars lining up a certain way. Nothing of this has any impact on us, because the only one who has an impact on us is whom? The God who said, let there be light. With me? That's, that's the first thing that we should get out of this little passage in Genesis, a little passage. Another thing that's, that's kind of cool as you read these stories, and I'm not necessarily encouraging you to do it, but you, they're, they're fun and they're incredibly weird, is how humans come into being. There, there's one story that comes out of Acadia, and there's, of course, there's bunches of gods, because there's always bunches of gods. And there are big gods and little gods. There are powerful gods and not-so-powerful gods. And the purpose of the not-so-powerful gods is to bring food to the big gods. That, that's, that's their whole purpose in life, is they've got these little gods, and these little gods get tired of it. So they unionize. I'm not making this up. That's the thing, you couldn't make any of this stuff up. It's really crazy. They unionize and go on strike. So all the little G god, the littlest G gods, the tiny G gods, are striking against the medium small G gods and not bringing them food, and they're getting hungry, so they create humans. And the purpose of humans is to bring them food take care of the menial stuff they don't want to do you, you handle the food stuff and and that's how almost all of those stories would describe humanity humanity's purpose is to bring food to and serve the the gods but what did what did we say no we you said something different it said so god created human beings in his own image in the image of god he created them male and female he created them see god values people God values people. We're not his tools. We're his image. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul in the New Testament says, put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Another place in Colossians, he says, you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. You're made like God and to be like God. And, matter of fact, what's the climax of the creation story? Us. He creates all the stuff and all the things, and when he gets everything ready, he places humans there and says, I want you to be in charge of this place. So we're created to run, to be the image of God, to, to be loved by God. Matter of fact, in a lot of the other stories, humans were created to bring food to God. Did you notice in our story, in Genesis, God feeds the people. He very specifically says, and I've made this for your food, and this for your food, and this for your food. I've made all this food. I've made a planet that recreates food for you. So God is feeding us, which is exactly the opposite. So God values people. But I want to, I there's another piece I really want to bring out because it's important to be said. Um, and there's something in the, that story I told you about the, about Marduk and Tiamat. And in that battle, Tiamat's the female, Marduk is the male. It says they engaged in combat, they closed for battle. The Lord, who be Marduk, spread his net and made it in circular. To her face he dispatched the, the Imhulu wind so that she could not close her lips. Fierce winds distended her belly. Her insides were constipated and she stretched her mouth wide. As you read a lot of these stories, there's a lot of violence against women there's a lot of hatred toward women. Like I said, Tiamat is made from the bitter waters. But what, what, did, what did Jesus say? What did they say in, the, in Genesis? God created humans in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. So God values humans, including women. And, and sometimes I think the church needs to say that because some people think the church doesn't value women. And I said this first service, and I, I, I don't know, I'm going to say it again second service. This is to help you understand how important it, under, it is that you recognize that God created and values us. 
There, if, as you watch the news, read the news, what, however you consume news right now, you'll see there's this huge thing going on where certain states are busy passing laws enabling people to have, to have abortions, actually to kill the baby when it's three years old. Apparently, it's where directions some of them seem to be going. And there's the other extreme. You've got people passing really, really, and it seems like there's this battle. And what, what you have to kind of get in your head as you're watching this battle unfold in front of you is it's about this. It's all about value. Matter of fact, if you just recognize the idea that we get our value inherently from God, and if you take away a God who creates us in his image, we lose our value. We lose our source of value. And then you look at the news and you see people fighting like they're fighting. What they're fighting for is value. And what they don't understand, because you take God out of the picture, if you take away the value of the human Preborn, you've taken the value away from a human who is born. Does that make sense? Because we get our value from God. And so I am inherently valuable. I don't have to do anything to earn it. I can't even screw it up. God loves me, period, because I'm made in his image, created in his image, and I have that value. Now, if you deny that value, you've got to go find it somewhere. Because we are created to want value. To, we need to be valuable. We need to be valued. You ever seen your if you had if you had kids you ever have your kids in a point where they just feel unva- unvalued and you have to just pour into them and let them know how valuable they are. Matter of fact, you ever have a point where you feel unva- lack not valued and you're like needing value? Well, if you have a God who creates us in His image, you have value. And if you don't, you got to find it. And it's incredibly ironic and sad to me that a lot of people are fighting for their value by denying their value. Because you take the value away from the the unborn child, you take the value away from the adult. And it becomes a vicious circle of trying to find value. Matter of fact, if you just take that when you're watching the news, just think, is that person searching for value? It will explain so much of the news, how people are reacting and why they're reacting the way they're reacting. It's because they're denying this part that humans have value from God, male and female. And I bring up female also because our culture is at war with female value. Our culture does their best to devalue females. Every magazine cover is an attack on women. Because if you are this size, you are valuable. And if you're a different size, you're not. If you have this look, you're valuable. If you don't have this look, you're not. If you're a super mom, you're valuable. If you have normal kids, you're not. If you have the super powerful job and raise perfect kids at the same time, you are valuable. And if somehow you don't have the super powerful job and raise perfect kids, you're not. And the culture is constantly bombarding women with the idea that either their body is wrong or their mind is wrong or what they do for a living is wrong. And there's this ideal up here that no human has ever come close to living up to. And you are told, women, that if you don't live up to this and look like this, you don't have value. And God says that's a load of crap. Because your value has nothing to do with the size of your wardrobe. It has nothing to do with what you do for a living, whether you take care of kids full-time or never. Your value comes from the fact you are created in the image of God and he embellishes into you all the value you could ever dream of wanting and all the love you could ever dream of wanting because God is absolutely crazy about you just exactly the way you are. Now, you may ch- choose to, you know, eating right's a good idea and taking care of yourself's a good idea, but it doesn't make God love you anymore. Back 10 years ago when I was fatter than I am now, God loved me exactly the same as he does now. Right? And by the way, guys, the culture attacks your value all the time too, just a different way. Matter of fact, a lot of you, are in a, in a culture where you get to wear your, your perceived value right here all the time. Because you have a little, st- little badge right here that tells what your value is, what's your rank. Oh, okay, this is how valuable you are. 
Or the rest of the culture tells if you succeed a certain level, you have a, you have a bank account a certain size, you have a car that's worth a certain value, a certain kind of house, a certain kind of... If you have succeeded at a certain level, you have value. And guys have all kinds... Matter of fact, we, we're working, Pastor Barry's working really hard to come up with um, some ministries to help guys as, as they transition out of the military where they suddenly can't even figure out, you know, because it, it's, it's a really hard transition. Ask anybody who's going through it. Because... Used to be your value is right here. You could always just check it. Now we don't wear those anymore. So where do I get my worth? Same place women get their worth. You get your worth because you're created in the image of God. And in the moment of your creation, God placed in you an immense amount of value. And there is nothing you can do to lessen that value. There's nothing you can do to lessen how much God loves you. And it's cool Because we learn that on the first page of the Bible. As we compare what other cultures thought about humans with what the Bible says right off the bat, we see we are in a totally different world. Okay? One more thing that we see that's really different. Um, As we look at the other accounts of how creation is made, they're one of God's enemies in all those accounts is chaos. There's, it's almost like personified chaos. There'll be cha- it's just chaotic. The water's chaotic. There'll be beasts that are made that are chaotic, these ginormous monsters, and they're all chaotic, and they're all fighting God. As a matter of fact, in Baker Encyclopedia says that most creation accounts from the ancient world began with a primeval chaos. The God who could conquer chaos was understood as the true and living God. That Game of Thrones thing, battle on our way to the top. But... If we go back to Genesis, verse 2, it says this. This is because it starts out that way. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. Ah, we got our chaos. Formless, empty, deep waters. Chaos. Here comes the battle. Not exactly. It just next says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. God's hovering over it. It has no power. See, See, the whole thing in Genesis 1 is against that idea that there's this chaos God's fighting. Because you notice God's just saying, you know, I think it would be really cool to have land. And it happened. It'd be really cool to have, I don't know, flowers. I think it'd be really cool to have birds. And then when it's, if you notice as we read through it, it didn't just say, you know, and so three birds showed up. It's like, and the sky's full of birds. It, it's, it's swarming and, you know, it's just, it's just chaotic almost how much life God creates. And then he goes to the people and says, oh yeah, there's still room. Make more. Make more of this stuff. And so God's just constantly in that. He's creating and ordering and focusing and there's no chaos battling God. And what we learn from that is God is a God of peace and order. There's no battle here. There's no war going on. There's no chaos going on. God's a God of peace and order. Jesus said it this way. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have overcome the world. I've always overcome the world. Now, Let's, let's stop and think about this for a second. One of the things I've, I've said for a, this whole series, and I've said it a, a lot, is when you're personally reading the Bible, there's three steps to reading the Bible. Step one is to recognize what it says. To come into the book without as many of your preconceptions as you can so that you're hearing really what the author wanted you to hear and what the original hearers heard. That's why we went through that spot. We want to hear what they heard because a lot of times they'll... They hear more clearly than we sometimes do with our chaotic 21st century brains. So we say, what does it say? And then we ask the question, what does it mean? And what it means is, what are the, and that's what we did today. We took Genesis 1, and we went through and we found three things that it means. These are the deeper truths, the things that God's in control without rival. God values people, men, women, all of us. And God's a God of peace and order. So we saw what it says. We saw what it means. And now we can ask the question, what does it mean to me? And the question becomes, as you read what it means, does any of it apply to you? 
can you see how what this means can flow into your life? Like, I don't know, there might be somebody in the room who's battling chaos in their life. I know life's normally, there's a certain level of chaos that's just background noise. You know, there's always a level of chaos. In you. But every once in a while, your chaos meter pegs to 11, right? Something, like some of you guys might be PCSing, permanent change of station here pretty soon. We got people moving to Korea. That, now that's pegging your chaos meter right there. Right? You're going as far away as you can get. All right? And some of you got kids stuff going on. Some of you got kids graduating from high school or college. Some of you are figuring out what you're doing. And, and your chaos meter's way up here. And you've got a God of order and peace. And when your life gets chaotic, you can forget there's a God of order and peace. And you think the world's chaotic and chaotic is normal and there's nothing you can do about it. And you can start to be overwhelmed by the chaos. Just like in those or, or other stories, the other creation stories, where the chaos is, is battling against God. And we've got a God who says, I'm just hovering over the surface of that chaos. It, it's got nothing on me. I'm a God who brings... And here's, here's the really cool part about that. If God is a God of order and peace, then his universe is at its heart a universe of order and peace. And while chaos may seem normal, it's the aberration. It's not the default setting of the universe. And it shouldn't be the default setting of our lives. And the cool, I mean, it's really cool how often in the Bible God tells us a story where there's everybody, somebody's in the midst of chaos, and in the midst of that chaos, God brings peace. You know, there's a, a storm, and Jesus comes walking on the water because the storm is chaos. The storm water is chaos all the time. There's a storm, there's chaos, chaotic water, and Jesus is walking on it like it's pavement. And when the time's right, he says, and it's gone. There's a cool, really cool one where Jesus is sleeping in a boat. And again, it's a storm, and it's water, and it's chaos. And his followers are freaking out and terrified because, well, they're going through life work, we're going through life. And sometimes you get the chaos, when it pegs at 11, you're, you're, cra- you're going crazy. And, and they wake Jesus up, and it, they had to wake Jesus up because the chaos... Was it bothering him a bit? Because he's the God of peace. And he walks and looks at the water. And I've always said Jesus is actually ticked at this point because, okay, have you ever been woken up from a nap and not been ticked? And he walks out on the, on the edge of the, on, to the top of the boat and he yells at the water. My, Steve Davis' translation. The, 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 the regular translation says, peace, be still. But he just woke up from a nap. He thought, he had, shut up! And the thing went calm, and he went back downstairs. That's the God we serve. So you're in the midst of chaos, and you can know that if God wants to stop the chaos, he can at any moment. But even if he doesn't, he's in control of it anyway. So you can have peace. I could see that having relation for some people. And a lot of us feel worthless from time to time. We've got, like I said, a culture that speaks worthlessness to us, that tells us we don't have value. And we can say what? When our, when our inner voice starts saying, you're worthless, you don't have value, you're, you're starts, you know, anybody not have that inner voice that's constantly telling you bad things? You can, you can do the Jesus to that one too. Because Jesus walks out on the edge of the boat and says, shut up. And you can look at those inner voices that are saying that you're worthless, that you don't meet up to some standard. And you can look at it and you can say, shut up. As God said, let's make them in our image, in our likeness, male and female. Don't make them just like us. And you can hold that up and say, look, I've got value. You can shut up, voice. Voice is telling me I don't have value. You are wrong. I'm going to speak truth back to that lie. And of course, bottom line, we're all looking at a world that seems out of control, right? Just seems like everything's going crazy. Everywhere you look, the world's crazy. 
And remember, the universe wasn't created crazy. It was created at peace by a God of peace. It was created in control by a God of control. And the chaos that we see, the, the, the fighting, the infighting, it's not quite an illusion, but it's insanely temporary. In the overall scheme of the universe, the chaos we have will be gone like that. And God restores his kingdom and his purposes. And we know that because God's been in control from the beginning. He's in control when there's the waters and the spirit of God is hovering over the waters. He's in control when he says, let there be light. He's in control when humanity rebels. In the third chapter of Genesis, he's still in control and he starts the process. He's in control when he brings up a nation called Israel to produce a Messiah named Jesus. He's in control when as God himself, Jesus goes to a cross. And as that song we just sang right before I came up here said, as Jesus dies on a hill, he created. Is that control or is that control? He's in control when he goes into the tomb. He's in control when he comes out of the tomb. He's in control when he ascends to heaven. He'll be in control when he ascends from heaven and begins the final work of restoring creation so we can spend eternity learning all the wonders of what he's created. All the wonders of him. And you are temporarily in a situation that seems out of control. But your God has never for a millisecond, not been in complete control. That was somebody going, yeah, I like that point. That's the modern amen. People used to say amen. Now they go, ding, 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 ding. If you're a follower of Christ, that's the God you follow and serve. And if you're not a follower of Christ, guess what? He did all of this to restore you to himself. And if you would like to have that relationship with God, if you've never had a relationship or you want to renew that relationship with Christ, what we ask you to do is at the end of the, end of the service, you just pick up one of these blue bags. We have them on the end of the platform. We have them on a couple of tables in the back. If you grab one of these bags, somebody that's trained will take about 10 minutes. They'll walk you through the contents of the bag and show you how to have that relationship with Christ. If you have the relationship with Christ, you have to announce that. You wanna, it's big news you want to announce it. We announce it through baptism. Um, normally, we do baptism the first Wednesday of every month, but this year, first Wednesday is July 4th, and nobody wants to come. Also, this is a cool story. I've got to tell you the story. Um, you know how we, we said that, you know, we have people that they, they come for a while, we work in their lives, they, they move away. It happens all the time. Um, we had a guy a, a couple, about a month or so ago who contacted me, and he came to our church for a while, never got around to accepting Christ, and as he's moved on, he was ready, and so he me- actually messaged me and says, hey, can I come back on this su- specific Sunday? I'm going to be in the area. Can I come back, and could you unpack a blue bag with me? And then we had a guy just, actually his wife contacted me, um, about a few weeks ago, that a guy who'd been coming here and was moving toward Christ but hadn't made a decision. And they moved to Jacksonville, North Carolina, and he's made a decision for Christ and he wants to be baptized here. So he's coming back on June 23rd, so we're going to do a baptism Sunday morning during our one service on the, June 23rd. And if you want to be baptized, you can be baptized on June 23rd. Just let us know. We'd love to get you plugged into there. Now, it could be you want to begin the process or continue the process of growing into the person God designed you to be. We've got our step classes for that. That's where you you proceed through the process of learning how God made you, why God made you, how you can live into your potential. And the step classes are Sunday nights at 6. Tonight's class is step 2 where we teach you the foundations for how to grow as a follower of Christ. And that'll be at 6 o'clock in Steel Fortress. We have child care. Just show up. We like surprises. So just show up. Um, It could be, as we've been talking today, um, there's something in your heart you want to pray about, you want to talk to God about. It it could be something related to what what we've talked about. It could be something totally different, just something that's in your life. We have a cross in the corner. During the next song, you're invited to just go over there and pray. You can stand, you can kneel, whatever. God's not crazy about posture. You can just pray about anything you want to pray about. 
If you want to pray with somebody, we've got some people lined up around the outside of the auditorium who just love to pray with you. You have to approach them. They won't approach you. And they'll confidential, whatever you have them pray for, that's as far as it goes. But if you have somebody pray with you during this next song, just go up and talk to one of them. If you want to take communion t- today, we've got communion stations, one in the back, one in the front. A place for you to celebrate what Christ has done on the cross and death and burial and resurrection. I hope you've gotten sort of what I've been trying to get to with this whole series on In the Beginning. And that is, don't be afraid of the Bible. Don't be afraid that it's not going to say what you want it to say. Let it speak. Let it speak into your life. Try your best to put aside your prejudices and all the things you want the Bible to say and let it speak. I've, I've spent my life since I was, I don't know, fifth grade with this weird belief that God can speak to me through his word. Not weird, crazy, go in your basement and type up diatribes for the internet weird. But I mean, just God can direct me and guide me. And I've always tried to let him speak instead of me speaking to it and telling the Bible what it should say. I want to let it speak to me. And I hope you've seen as we've worked through this series that God is capable of speaking through his word if we let it say what it says. We just let it speak. And we ask, what does that mean? And we punctuate with, what does it mean to me? And when we do it that way, we learn that we serve a God who is totally in control, which is a truth I can apply all day long every day. We learn that God loves us and values us, which is, again, a truth I can apply all day long every day. And that God's a God of order and peace. Which is once again a truth I can apply all day long, every day. Especially those days when the world seems out of order and my life seems absent of peace. I can remember the God I serve is totally in control of everything around me. That he brings peace in chaos and that he loves me and values me more than I can ever know. Amen. Would you stand with us?